Good morning. And welcome to the worship service of Chalmers United Church in Kingston, Ontario. We are glad you're able to join us in the sanctuary or on YouTube. We welcome back and thank Reverend Erin Burns for leading us in worship this morning. She is the Interfaith Chaplain, Director of Faith and Spiritual Life at Queen's University. We would also like to thank our organist, Juliet Milsom, our guest pianist, Rita, K Rita Kang, our scripture reader, Aidan McClung, and coffee hosts, Heather Ferris and Jane McEwen, as well as our media techs, Brigitte Holshu and Aidan McClung. After the service, you are invited to McCallum Hall, through the doors, for refreshments, conversation, and birthday cupcakes as we celebrate all the April birthdays. On Monday, April 15th, the Outreach Circle will meet at 1.30 by Zoom. This is back to the original meeting date, not the one shown in the announcements. After church last week, there was a brief meeting to share ideas for fundraising for the stained glass window restoration. If you have any ideas that you haven't shared or wish to find out more, please contact Nick Steinberg or Doug Arend. Stay tuned next week to find out about the first fundraiser, a Max Sold auction. The Blessing Box is in desperate need of cans of meat or fish with pull tops as well as juice boxes. Contact Jan Trites to arrange a drop-off time. The Blessing Box and benevolent programs are always happy to receive financial donations too. Please check out the announcements in eBlast for details and more information about these and other announcements. And now an announcement from Heather. Good morning. Uh, this is short notice, but I, I did want to um, step in front of you all and say there is an inReach Circle meeting this Tuesday at 3, and it's via Zoom. And this is because uh, our regular meeting day was the day of the eclipse, so um, I, I've had to reorganize. I will send out an email uh, with the link and the agenda. Um, and if I've left anyone off the list, um, please pass on the email, uh, share it, because um, everyone is welcome. Thank you. The link is also in the bullet in, in the announcements every week. It's the same link for any meeting, so you can catch it yourself that way too. Please join me now in reading the acknowledgement of the land. The lands on which we are gathering today are the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. We acknowledge their enduring presence on this land as well as the presence of the Huron-Wendat, Métis, Inuit, and other First Nations from across Turtle Island. We deeply respect the many generations of people who have cared for this land and whose spiritualities, teachings, and ways of knowing are closely tied to it. We seek to build right relations with these peoples, to learn from them, and to live together on this land with respect and gratitude. We light this candle to remind us that Christ is the light of the world and present in our midst. May the life and words of Jesus enlighten us on our way. join me in the responsive call to worship. This is the season of Easter, the celebration of resurrection, the festival of hope, the promise of new beginnings, the dance of faith, the song of joy, the music of gladness, the hymn of love. Let us worship our life-giving God. Let us pray together. Make my heart and my feet be still, O Rock and Redeemer, 
The world around me continues in chaos. I cannot claim control over it. Instead, remind me of the breath of life that flows in me, in and out, in and out, in and out, continuously. O Rock and Redeemer, you are here, within me, around me, always. Thank you. Amen. We will now sing hymn 395 in Voices United. Come in, come in and sit down. Uh, and we're going to sing the refrain and beginning and end only. having me back. It is, it's been a couple of years since I've been here with you, and it is a delight today to be with you on this rainy Sunday morning. We've had a lot of those lately. I was observing, uh, I spend some of my Sundays out at St. Matthew's up on Weller Avenue, and it seemed every Sunday that I was supposed to be with them this winter, we had miserable weather. And so apparently I brought that with me to you today. So uh, I am going to speak about my work uh, as the Interfaith Chaplain at Queen's and as the Director of the Office of Faith and Spiritual Life uh, in bits and pieces today, a little bit right now and a little bit later on. But you may have looked in your bulletin and said, gathering around the story, time for discussion and reflection, and thought to yourself, what's that? Maybe a little bit? So I'm a firm believer in a children's time. This is where you all go, because you know what's coming. This is the audience participation part. So I firmly believe that part of our worship should be not just in our head reflecting, but fully interactive. And when we have children, we tend to do that visibly. And I always thought when I was in pastoral ministry that actually I was doing children's time for the grown-ups. The kids already know this stuff. So despite the discomfort is going to provide you, potentially, we're going to have a little bit of interaction in a few minutes. So I'm going to give you about three minutes to prepare yourself. So when I was here two years ago speaking about my work at Queen's, I was brand new. I had been in pastoral ministry for a number of years, uh, first on Wolf Island and then in Ottawa at a couple of congregations, and I had just come 
back. I arrived in January of 2022 uh, in the Omicron lockdown and learned to be a university chaplain from my basement that was not unpacked because we had moved from Ottawa at Christmas. So uh, when I saw you, I think it was in July or August, and I hadn't had a full year at Queen's yet. I hadn't even really had a full term. So the last two years, so I'm just finishing my second full school year. Uh, we are deep in the heart of exams right now. Uh, my understanding of my office and the direction that I'm taking it has adapted and changed a little. In short, the Office of Faith and Spiritual Life is part of student affairs at Queen's, and we provide supports for students through the lens of faith, spirituality, and the spiritual dimensions of mental health. So I'm the only full-time staff in the office, but I'm joined by two part-time chaplains, one Christian who works through uh, an interfaith lens like I do, and one Muslim chaplain. But the big change since the last time I came to be with you is that we have added student staff to our team. My first September, I hired three students, partly because I wasn't sure that I actually knew how to talk to 19-year-olds, having been in pastoral ministry for 15 years, uh, but to see what life and enthusiasm and creativity they would bring to our space and our programs. So it was, it was the best decision we have made in my two years there. So it, we started with three, which became four, and this year I have six student staff directly reporting to me, and another student that I share with another office. We have a full-time student joining us this summer to help develop programming for the upcoming school year. And really, adding students to our team has been such a huge boost to the office and to my joy in my work. So a couple of our students we've had for the two years, and I am heartbroken that they are moving on to other things uh, at the end of this term. But early in his time with us, one of my students, Jared, came into my office and said, Aaron, I, I have an idea. I think we should have a spirituality discussion group, because I think people are curious, and I, I think I could run it. What do you think? And I thought, ooh, this is interesting. And so the Voyager Spirituality Group was formed. So Jared runs the Voyagers program. It's a once-a-week student-led discussion group. I went to one, quickly realized people wanted me to be an expert, and didn't go back. Jared brings a weekly theme, some readings or poetry from different cultural perspectives or faith traditions, and uh, leads a meditation, and then they chat. Everyone brings their curiosity, their wonder, their desire for connection, and their experience into those conversations. And I love the evenings that I'm still there when they leave because they come out so full of life and enthusiasm and joy and calm. It's just amazing. So the themes that Jared chooses to bring to this group tend to be the big questions, the big themes of life, those existential questions, problems, and concerns, which we find our work rotates in and out of all the time. So often, when we are not 19, 20, 21, we tend to not spend a lot of time focusing on those big questions the same way for a whole bunch of reasons. But so I want you to, I'm gonna give you two minutes to turn to the folks around you, and if you're not sitting right next to somebody, you don't have to move, you can think in your head, we're gonna have a big conversation after. But I want you to think about when you were in your late teens and early 20s, what were the big questions for you? What were those big existential questions. So you have two minutes. Now, I am the mom of two small children, so two minutes looks like a lot of different things, but I'll pretend to watch my watch. Enjoy your conversation.
30 seconds to wrap up the thought you're having. So if you've moved, you don't have to go back. We're going to do it again in a minute. So what came up in your conversations? I better put my glasses on so I can see you. You don't have to put your hand up, just shout it out. What were the big questions in your life in your late teens, early 20s? What was I going to do with my life? What am I going to do with my life? Oof. Right? What else? Was I going to pass the exams every year? Oh, was I going to pass the exams every year? I had four of those on Friday. Yep. We are deep in the heart of exams right now, and people are feeling that one. There was another... Is there a God? Yeah. What else? What other big questions did you have? Um, I was a nursing student, mm -hmm. and as the patients were getting sicker and sicker as I went on in my course, yeah. I thought, will I be able to help them adequately so that they could then take over yeah. And also one more thing. I'm going to repeat that part before I forget it. So as a nursing student watching patients get sicker and sicker, what was, what was the second part? Can I, can I do it? What was the second part of what you had well, said? it's a whole different thing. A whole other thing? I joined Chalmers Choir and met a very nice tenor. Oh. <laughs> and and what, what will I do with that? Oh, so joining the church and joining the choir and meeting a lovely tenor. Mm. Which points to another question. What about relationships? What about relationships, right? What other questions did you think of? Ah, did miracles take place or is that just imagery? Any other Any other? Big questions you remember wrestling with. So your next question is what are the big questions in your life now? Or do you have all the answers? I mean, I hope that am I going to pass my exams one is done. For some of us, not for all of us. So, Again, it's two minutes, it's quick. What questions, are you, what questions do you have now? Big questions about life, the universe, and everything. I'm going to actually watch my clock this time. Thirty seconds to wrap up the thought that you're having, and then you're welcome to move back to your seat if you've moved. Yeah. 
Well, I think what was really interesting listening, not really hearing what you were saying, but listening was to the volume. You had quieter conversations the second time, but I think you had more to say. So what are those big questions in your life right now? What will the world be like? Pardon? What will the world be like? What are we leaving this world? What will the world be like and what are we leaving this world to? Will certain political leaders from certain political leanings be elected in upcoming elections? Mm, how can we bring young people in, especially around music? Yep. What else? Yeah, so what is it about this time and society that we're living in that has led our children and grandchildren to turn away or to not have space in their life for faith and spirituality? And I would say the church in particular. It's a tricky one. Yep. Yeah, if there's a God, why is there so much bad in the world? Yep. I think we ask that one no matter what age we are. Yeah. Any other big questions? Yep. Will my church continue to exist for my funeral? Yep. A bunch of these questions are about grief, right? Loss loss of community, concern about loss of community, concern about the future of the world, concern about our own self and our loved ones. These are connection questions and they are grief questions. Isn't that interesting? Any other last questions before I ask my very last one and then you won't have to talk anymore? Yep. Climate change, oh yeah, yep. Yep, that's a big one. So, where do you talk about these questions? I'm going to say, aside from church. In school. At school? Yeah. Where do you talk about these? Mom? At home? With close friends? Ah, with female friends, yeah. Yeah. So if we don't have a faith tradition, we don't have a community like this, maybe we don't have friends to have this conversation with, where do we have these conversations? What if we don't realize that everybody around us is having these same questions? How many of you just heard other people's questions and thought to yourself, oh yeah, that one too? right? And maybe you knew and maybe you didn't. Because sometimes when somebody else names what's going on for us, we have a better understanding of it. So increasingly we live in a post-Christian world and increasingly we live in a world where religion and spirituality are taboo for a whole bunch of reasons and some of them very good. So I work with students, some of whom have come through religious tradition, but most have not. Most of the students who I am spending time with right now 
are finding their way to my office, either through a program we run or a friend told them or a counselor told them that we would be good folks to talk to. And having these students come without the without a predisposition to this is how it is, or the push back, religion is always this, leads to some really amazing questions and conversations. I love when students come to my office with no background and want to explore what we would call spirituality. Those big questions, the questions that are so impossible to answer but that you need to ask with someone. Because we in the church have a history of asking these questions and grounding our life and our experience in these wonderings. But outside of religious tradition, where do we do this? So my work is with folks who are looking for community, who are looking for places to wrestle and question and wonder, They are not looking to be told what to believe or how to practice. They are looking for someone to explore with them, a safe place to wonder and wander, a place for opportunity and experience and illumination outside of the ways we maybe traditionally have done it. So we now are going to turn to more traditional illumination as I invite Aidan to come and lead us in our scripture. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Holy One, sacred mystery, greater than words can express, whose love for us and all creation exceeds our capacity to imagine. Open our hearts and minds to hear afresh your word to us today. Amen. The scripture today is from Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 43. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost He said to them, Why are you frightened, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they, in their joy, were disbelieving and wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. When I arrived at Queen's, I did think that my work would be primarily with religious students. I knew with my background, working with folks who were identified as spiritual but not religious, that I would probably do some of that. But I was surprised. So I'm going to use I and we interchangeably, so I as the chaplain and we as the office, because our work all sort of weaves together. There's very few things that I do that my office isn't deeply a part of, and vice versa. So working with religious students, sort of the thing we expected, I do connection and collaboration with faith-based groups such as the Muslim Student Association, with Hillel, with the uh, different Christian groups on campus. There's a Buddhist group that has uh, popped up in the last two years that we helped find space and get established. Uh, And I work uh, supporting accommodations for religious observance uh, when, for example, your exam is scheduled on Sunday morning when you normally go to church. So help with, uh, help students to facilitate or to support them through the process of of requesting a religious observance accommodation. But most of my work, our work, is really in the area of that spiritual dimension of mental health that would, as an umbrella, include religious practice or spiritual practice. So that spiritual dimension of mental health is around connection, connection to self, connection to community, 
to creation, to the holy, to the divine or God or the universe or whatever you want to name that if you have that belief. And then also questions of meaning making and values. So our questions hit on a bunch of those things, right? Connection to self, to community, to creation, and to God. Our big questions hit all of those pieces. So adding student staff to our office allowed us to give those students leadership opportunities. I am not a director who wants people to just sit and be ready if someone comes in. I want my students to have the opportunity to learn and grow and develop their skills uh, to create opportunities for others to experience connection, to ground themselves, and frankly, to take a break because we all go too hard too much of the time. So our programs that we ran this year include uh, Knit Happens, that was a new one this year, a student-run knitting and crochet site circle, which ran on Tuesday afternoons and had a fantastic uptick. We have been joking in the office that we do not ever proselytize except fiber arts. Most of the staff have learned to knit or crochet this year. And, and I didn't drive it. I did help, but I didn't drive it. We also had crafternoons. We ran a program called Connect For, which was programming that helped uh, folks who maybe don't have a sense of connection or community to come together to do something like board games or Lego or puzzles. Um, we run a program called Cooking with Grandmas, which is an intergenerational cooking program. Jared runs the Voyager Spirituality Group. Uh, we have a program called Allies in Faith that we run that's about exploring the intersection between allyship and spiritual practice for folks especially who are wrestling with it from their own religious perspective. Where we don't teach, we provide a space to wrestle together. Our chaplain staff, the three of us this year, provide one-on-one -on -one support for students around questions of faith, spirituality, vocation, family, meaning-making, intersectional identity. I work really closely with the Yellow House, which is the center for QT BIPOC students. Uh, we chat with folks about isolation and loneliness, anxiety and stress, grief and loss discernment for the future, all of those big questions and wonderings that you would think a chaplain might do. But we also run six-week grief groups and a monthly grief drop-in. We run a group for students. We, we call it Students Without Parents, new name pending, but we haven't come up with a new name yet. It's for students who have non-normative family experiences, who don't have the parental support that we sort of expect students to have because of the death of parents or estrangement or that they have come through foster care. We run a discussion program for Muslim students with the Muslim chaplain. I do wellness walks, which is the non-churchy name for forest church that I do a couple times a year. A creativity is spiritual practice program. Two weeks ago, we brought in a floor labyrinth for a day for students to come and take a few minutes to take care of themselves and ground themselves before they headed into exams. We've worked with career services to run workshops on meaningful work, that what am I going to do with my life question, uh, and with uh, Elder Al from the Office of Indigenous Initiatives for a monthly prayer for peace gathering, where rather than responding to individual events in the world, we know events are always happening that we need to create space for students to gather for, and so we have been doing that once a month. I absolutely love my work. I love it every day. Every day brings new things. I get to be creative, but most importantly, I get to interact with, support, and empower amazing young people and to be inspired by them in return. I regularly get asked questions that I do not have answers to, and I get to say, oh, I don't know. What do you think? And we see where the conversation goes. I hope I am never so sure in my answers, 
that I give an answer to those questions instead of joining in on the journey. When I sat down to plan our service today, I looked at the lectionary reading, and one of the joys of guest preaching is that you don't have to do the lectionary reading if you don't want to. You can pick another one if it doesn't fit. But today, it fit, and I was delighted. I really love the Easter stories, the stories of the resurrected Jesus appearing in unexpected ways and unexpected places, and in so many instances, sharing a meal. These are some of my favorite Bible stories because, from my understanding, they illustrate that deep grief and loss that his followers were experiencing, the sense of deep connection to one another, and deep hope for what is to come. These stories follow kind of a general arc. In the days following Jesus' death, his followers are grieving so much. The death of their friend, the potential loss of their movement and their direction in life, the what am I going to do, combined with it hurts so much, combined with fear for their own existence. And into those moments of overwhelming grief and fear comes Jesus, who offers them peace. Not just as a greeting, which it would have been, but as a gift. In the face of grief, we offer peace. They talk about their disbelief and their wonder and in their curiosity of the moment. Our text today said, and I absolutely love this part, while in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and he ate it. It's a running joke in our office that you can always get Oreos from us. Oreos are kosher, makes it easy to keep them in the cupboard. Uh, Food is a powerful piece of community. We know that as church. Some of our most amazing conversations in our lives as people and as people of faith happen around the table where we eat together. Food is also important for our sustenance and our ability to do all the other things we need to do. So a few months ago, I was taking a mental health first aid course, and so many of the how would you respond to dot, dot, dot questions, I answered with, well, I would offer them something to eat and drink, probably a tea and a cookie. Because we have to nourish our bodies so we can nourish our spirits. And sometimes that gift of even a cookie and a cup of tea is huge. Eating together matters. Two weeks ago, my family had the fantastic experience of being invited by the Muslim Student Association to participate in their iftar gathering. So at the end of the day, when they have been fasting for Ramadan, we gather together to break fast, to pray, and to share a meal. And we had a wonderful evening connecting with students and watching students connect with one another. Watching students connect with my, my kids are 12 and 9, and watching my students connect with them and invite them into their conversations was just so heartwarming. And then this past Thursday, our office started our exam drop-ins. Our office is in Mitchell Hall, beside two of the gyms that are primarily used as exam sites. Weekdays during exams, we open the office from 10.30 to 2, generally later than 2, but we only promise 2 at this time of year, for people to drop in for cookies, conversation, coffee, and support. This term, we added three days of soup, which has been a hit. This is our fourth exam period running the program. The first time, our turnout was really low because we were dealing with that stigma that people have about religion. People thought if they came to our office that we would try and convert them or push religion on them, or that they had to be religious to come and participate. But one day, a brave group of engineers wander in and said, we don't believe in God, can we have a cookie? And we were like, yes, please, come in. 
These students come back several times each exam period and we love to catch up with them. So it built a little and it built a little and some people come just for that snack. They've been writing, that little sugar hit. Some people come on their way to their afternoon exam because they've been so stressed they haven't eaten. Some people come because their exam went badly and they need an adult to cry with. They need someone to sit with them and not tell them that it's gonna be okay, but to just be present with them while they de decompress and debrief. And sometimes they come because they need to do that with one another. When the Psych 100 exam happens, we almost always get a little circle of students who we hold space, but they care for one another. And in December this year, four months into our knitting program, students came to show us their finished projects that they were taking home to give as Christmas presents. This Thursday and Friday, we served snacks and soup to almost 120 students. My favorite part, every time, I love sitting and connecting with them, but there's this moment that happens at least once or twice a day where eavesdropping on them on their way out, a student will say to another student, I didn't know how much I needed this, but it's helped. So often it's those little things, seemingly little things, something to eat, a place to gather, someone to listen, a tissue, maybe even a laugh that makes the big difference. I come back again and again to Jesus' words, peace be with you. So many of the students who access the services and community of our office are people desperate for peace, who live with grief, be it bereavement or change or the things they miss through the pandemic or just the weight of everyday life. And I endeavor to create a space and supports for them to do that, to grieve, to wonder, to search. Not to tell them how, but to help them find ways for themselves, to identify what peace is for them, what comfort and support and practice they need, what connection means, what prayer or spiritual practice might look like, what peace could feel like. A proudest moment for me as the director of the unit happened almost a year ago today. Jared, the student I mentioned earlier, brought me another idea. He's an ideas man. We have great conversations. He wanted to do a podcast about the intersection of blackness and spirituality. So we set up a time. Jared met with two students, Salma, who works in my office, and Monique, another student they knew, to record our conversation that was featured as part of the Shift podcast. So one of the ways that you can learn about some of the diversity and inclusion and changing campus culture work that is happening at Queen's is through the SHIFT podcast. It can be found uh, on the um, radio station website. And it's a project from Student Affairs. It features students from diverse backgrounds speaking about their lived experiences at Queen's and how these experiences are shaped by identity, their visions for a safer and more inclusive campus climate, and what needs to happen for there to be a meaningful and lasting shift. And the one that my office partnered with them on is called Find Your Peace. That particular episode is a little over an hour long. And I, as the, I didn't hear it till it was published. A colleague of mine worked with the students to put it together, and I didn't hear it till it was out. And I had to listen to it in pieces so that I could reflect. These students brought so much wisdom and authenticity and vulnerability to their conversation. Jared is a gifted facilitator who does an amazing job of drawing out meaning and vulnerability and care from the people he's working with. Towards the end of the podcast, there's a part that has stuck with me and I think about every single day. So Jared asks, they're talking about being black women on campus and the ways that black women are so marginalized and discriminated against. And Jared asks these two amazing young women what wisdom, words of encouragement, et cetera, they would offer to other black women. 
And Salma, they, they hum and haw about that being a weighty question, but Salma says, honestly, I would love all women, honestly, everyone, to feel, especially women, because there's so much always going on externally and internally, just find your peace. Find your peace. Once you find your peace, everything becomes just very mellow and you move literally with intent, with passion, with love, and just radiate that. And I think there's nothing more powerful than women radiating their energy and who they are because then other women see it. And other women need to see that because it just drives others. It's just beautiful to see. And at the end of the day, here's this piece. Everything else that's external is just distractions, just opinions, which is something you get so caught up on because of the way society is. But at the end of the day, it's you and you with yourself and what you do with that. So I think finding peace and being at peace with yourself and who you are is so important. Monique adds, and if you are ever scrambled and don't know where your piece went, like it fell out of your pocket or got lost or something, just listen to your heartbeat. Sit quiet and listen to the beat of your heart that's blood pumping into every single thing that everybody has like everybody around you. Yours has the same thing at a different tempo. Get to know yours. We live in a weighty world. As young people, as seniors, we live in weighty times. And in our moments of grief, of stress and anxiety, of worry, of loneliness, of fear, we are invited into that connection, connection with community, connection with creation, connection with the holy. But to do it, we must accept what is offered Peace be with you. Find your peace. Amen. Our hymn is from More Voices, number 135, called by Earth and Sky.
For those of you at home who would like to contribute to the life and work of Chalmers, the information is in the e-blast and on the screen. For those of you in the sanctuary, your offering can be placed in the offering plates at the back of the church before or after the service. We will now sing the offering hymn 577 in Voices United, I've Got Peace Like a River. Please use the slides or hymn book as the bulletin has the verses in a different order. grateful for the way that you have lived God's hands and feet in the world in this place by your contribution uh, this morning to the Chaplain's Trust, which is a fund that uh, operates out of my office that allows me to provide emergency bursary support to students and to provide uh, programming, particularly around food. I am very grateful for the opportunity to be with you today uh, to share about the work that I am doing, and so thank you for having me. One of the things that became very real when I arrived at Queen's was just how human the face of suffering is. I mean, I knew global conflicts and emergencies were real and had significant human impact. But part of my work of supporting students includes sitting with students from places of conflict whose immediate families are in immediate danger, who live with fear in so many ways. So today in our prayers, I invite you to reach your heart beyond the headlines and the media, to hold those who are deeply impacted, including those students here in our community who are hurting in real and significant ways. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, gathered as your people in this place, we receive your offer of peace. Help us to find our peace. Help us to find the peace that grounds us in your love and allows us to offer that love and hope into the world. And as we find our peace, May that peace expand greater and greater loving God to your hurting world. We hold in our heart places of conflict, those that make the news each day and those that don't. Help us to be a channel of your peace Help leaders to make decisions based in the sanctity of life. 
loving God in a world that is so hurting. Help us not to close our eyes. Help us not to turn away. We pray this day also, loving God, for those who are hungry, who live with food insecurity, who have inadequate shelter, who are struggling with illness, mental and physical, those who are grieving so many losses and hurts. We pray for those who are lonely, who are isolated, who are disconnected. And loving God, in this time of silence, we offer up those prayers that sit so deep in our hearts. Loving God, you are with us and within us, and you know the prayers of our hearts and the thoughts of our minds, and you greet us with an offer of peace. We are grateful people, loving God. We are so thankful. And so just as we worry, just as we struggle, we give thanks. And so in this moment of silence, loving God, we lift up our gratitude for moments of peace, of hope, of joy. Loving God, help us to find our peace and help us all to create spaces and supports for others to find their peace. In this moment, all together, we listen, sit quietly, listening to the beat of our hearts, the pumping of our blood in every one of us, our hearts beating together, offering these prayers together, and saying together a paraphrase of the prayer that Jesus taught us, found on Voices United number 916 and in your bulletin. Eternal Spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, Father and Mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven. The hallowing of your name echo through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is from More Voices, number 145, Draw the Circle Wide.
Our benediction today is a prayer of blessing to be who you are. May you know you are worthy. May you unlearn all the silence and shame you were taught through hints and insinuations. May you stand tall and walk proudly, delighting in the shape and movement of your body as you travel through the world, spirit in flesh, breath in dust, beloved child and image of God. May the truth woven into your being find its way out into words and music, in dance and poetry, in loving and marching, in creating and tearing down. May you know your own power to speak and to listen, to make room for others and to claim what is yours. May you be heard, may you be seen, may you take up space in the world, may you be who you are, whole and holy, blessed and beautiful, bold and brave. Be who you are, it is enough. And so may you go out with a sense of wonder into God's world and a sense of delight at Jesus' teachings and a sense of hopefulness at the Spirit's leading. May your faith be empowering. May your love be undaunted. May your hope be unflagging. May you be blessed and may you be a blessing. Amen.